Has your heart come up into pride? Like Uzziah. Does that thing have to die before you can behold him high and lifted up and see these seraphim screaming holy? And seeing worship happen like we've seen in the Philadelphia church to come back to what it was all about in the beginning. And Andre Crouch knew it. Take me back to the day I first believed when the balloon was so crystal clear and I knew experientially what it was all about. When the foundation was so firm and the revelation from the Father of the Son to my heart was so vividly clear. Take me back to when it all began. Take me back to a testimony that declares the power of God and not for Gehazi's ways, not for prideful ways, but for the glory of God all the way. verse 21 for a story that we've all heard a lot and I'm going to go ahead and read that first and then we're going to pray and then I'm going to look at some um, little bits of news that I wanted to touch on and then we'll get into some thoughts about the word and I'll even catch you up on some of the stuff I was already recording this week before we watch the whole video I don't think we're going to watch the entire video um, that I made this week but maybe one day we will just the longer version of just expounding on things that I thought was really important because the devil never ceases, amen, to bring strange thoughts into the house of God and among people talking about the things of God, Bible believers, there's always another strange way of looking at things and I tell you, that is our biggest problem. It's, it's not so much that people try to leave the churches or leave the Bible or leave the faith, it's just because they're full of ideas that just don't bring that germination of the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. And they that are led by the Spirit are the sons and daughters of God, and if that is true, which it is, everything else is 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 not the main emphasis. And we ought to keep a heart that is very, very genuine before the Lord our God, and to take Him as seriously as you see Him demanding because of who He is without being able to change Himself. It's the only response there rightly is to a God who is, who is who He really is, the God of all creation. And we know Him by the things that are made, so no one will have an excuse to say they didn't know. It's an inconvenient truth to our flesh to take in how glorious and powerful God truly is. So I'm going to go ahead and read the text, and we're going to know this, this text here. It's going to be in regards to... Um, it's going to be about... Coming to God for to know Him, is it a relationship we're after or is it some type of a gain or some type of way of using the strength of God, this, the river of God? Are we going to try to use the truth about God for our own personal gain? And this is the story of Gehazi, which we all know. There's several which came to my mind and I didn't write them all down quick enough. But I, uh, I got enough down to remember through the Word of God, how people were able to try and take the truth of God and make it something that it's not, and um, bringing swift um, problems for themselves. Amen. So let's go ahead and read, and then we'll pray. And verse 21 says, So Gehazi followed after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well, my master hath said me, saying, Behold, even now there Come to me from Mount Ephraim, two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. And Naaman said, Be content, take two talents. And he urged him, and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments, and laid them upon two of his servants, and they bare them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their, their hand, 
and bestowed them in the house. And he let the men go, and they departed. But when, but he went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went no whither. And he said unto him, Went not mine heart with thee? When the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee, is it a time to receive money, and to receive garments, and olive yards, and vineyards, and sheep, and oxen, and men servants, and manservants? The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee, and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we praise you in your house today, Lord God, and we do fear your name, knowing that according to what your word is telling us here and all kinds of other places, Lord, that you are to be taken seriously, and when you're speaking, we are to receive it under the mantle that you have initially called it to. And Lord, I pray that that's what we will come to you for, for to come to you because you are worthy to be sought after and listened to and tremble before, Lord God, and, and, and receiving even thy love, God, but not to be using you for things that we might want in our own flesh, losing sight of all that we had had in the beginning vision, Lord God, if there was a vision that came from you in the beginning at all. Most High God, I pray that there would be a people that will always yearn to come into a place where they know your word is true, not only your written letter, but your, your rhema word as well. A personal word that came from your, your own heart. A perfect word for every heart that does yearn for you. A place of testing of faith. Or a place of separation. Or a place of gaining a new challenge. But may we gladly bear the reproach of the cross... And receive this, receive all that comes with Calvary. The good and the, and, and the challenges, God. This gospel that came according to the power of God, may we receive it gladly as it is, as it is written, Lord God. Be with your people today and speak to every heart, Lord God, for I cannot preach. But I know by your power, Holy Spirit, I know that you can do a good job of reaching all those that have hearts to hear. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Well, amen. Well, we see the clear text here. We know what happened here, that Gehazi was supposed to be following, and he's, and he's so used to, obviously so used to just, hey, I think I could grab something here. I'm going to go ahead and grab it. Why not? What's the, what's the difference? What's the big deal? And I understand him to be walking with a man of God who really did know what the, what the big deal was. It was a very, very big deal. Elijah and Elisha were both very, very real prophets, and they feared God straight from the top to the bottom, and they are always passing tests of true faith before God. And someone else didn't really understand the seriousness of it, so they were not taking it as seriously, and constantly being warned and constantly being um, tested. You know, don't go where you're going. This is not the way you handle the Word of the Lord. And there's many people in the Word of God who have done this. They've tried to take the Word of God and make it into something else. And I'm here to say that this is a, a very, very risky thing because it hasn't worked out good for any of the people. Now we can remember in, in Timothy, where Paul's writing to Timothy, talking about people who are destitute of the truth, and they will they, they preach that godliness is gain. They're going to make the godliness, hey, you're going to come to God and this is how it's going to happen for you. Well, Gehazi just proved that that's not true. He got leprosy, and it was such a severe judgment that it didn't even stop with just him. He, he, he pronounced judgment on his entire family continuously because of how much he tried to misuse what God was doing. Inconceivable. When you really take this thing in, it makes you really take God seriously. And that's another part of what I want to talk about. Two things tonight. If we can get these two things, I think that we're going to grab a good heart of a part of God's heart for His church that really wants to be for real before Him. And that is one that the more we know of Him, the deeper the reverence we come before Him. Say that again. The more that we learn of God as He truly is, the deeper the respect we come to Him. We come before His throne in a mighty deep respect because we realize what's really going on. The deeper knowing, the more 
He becomes our life. And the more He becomes our life, the more we need Him like a diver under the ocean needs his, his oxygen tank. And he, and he holds on to that knowing this is for his life. And other people, they don't hold on to God like he's an oxygen tank because he hasn't become their life. Their life has not become in Christ. Christ isn't their life for real. So they don't hold on to it in an intense way as though it is for their life. They don't hold on to their parachute as though, it's, uh, as though the plane's going down. They're not holding on to it in a very, very serious way. They're holding on to it in a very careless way, thinking how can they gain for them because that is their life. Outside of God. They were outside of God to begin with. And then they come, into, they come around people who are in the faith and they don't really understand. They understand parts of it. Oh, that sounds good because you're into that or something like that. And it kind of brings up another thought about how people... Try to act as though it doesn't matter what you believe. As long as you have faith in something, it, that, that's enough. And I say to people who believe that they don't see people's personal faiths and pure personal religions, if you will, or their worship before their God or their own personal convictions before their God, to say they're all just the same is to bring God, faith in God down to the level of your favorite kind of ice cream. Or your favorite kind of restaurant to go to. Or your type of the opposite sex to date. You bring, you bring something that is eternal faith down to the level of personal preference. And I tell you, that is a mockery to all religions. To say they can all be right is a mockery to them all. They cannot all be right. They are not all right. God, The Bible says, Behold, the Lord thy God is one God, and he shall we serve. Knowing the terror of the Lord shall we persuade men to turn ye, turn ye, for why shall ye die? Turn ye unto what he wants. You don't come to him for what you're going to get from it. You come to him to know him. Can you imagine all the people that you know? Most people in their life, they probably really know, probably around 10 people that they could really say, I really know this piece of person. Probably that or less. You know, a small circle of people that you really, really, really know. And among those people that you got on your speed dial or the most people that you mostly call on your phone, these people you know the most and you don't know those people because of what they're going to give to you. You know them because you just like them. You're, you're in relationship with them, whether they're your friends or your colleagues or your church friends or ministers that you know or whatever they are. They are a regular occurrence because you just like them. You love them and you're a part of their life, and you just contact them because you just love to be in their company, and you love to fellowship with them. It's not about, oh, I want to be friends with them because I want to gain money from them. I want to use them or manipulate the situation to receive of them. And I tell you, when people try to make God into, I want to know God, I want to be a part of the church so I can find business deals, I want to find a nice relationship here, I want to find different things that is going to please me outside of His will. My dear friends, that is Gehazi. Okay? You're trying to use what God has established for His glory, His people, is His bride, to be set apart from the world for His honor, and then you're going to try to say, oh, it's okay, that doesn't matter. I just want to use what God has established for my own good. This is chaff, my friend. This is not the path of life. You're misusing the truths of God. Godliness is gained to those that don't know God. They don't want a relationship with God. All they want is to use this thing for their own personal wicked gain. But if they were to behold him and to learn of his ways and the sight of their soul was to behold him in his majesty and perfect royalty, they would come to him with utter reverence and respect saying, I count it all but lost that I may win this one who is at the right hand of the Father. Like Paul said, Paul had his own ideas until he really, Saul had his own ideas until he had in contact with God. This became real and all his other ideas were gone. You never see him selling God out. You never see him going through this. You would see him having struggles, but he was true to something that the world didn't understand, and there was always a conflict, and they didn't like it, so they tried to nail him for it. Massive amounts of persecution for those people who live in this world, and they do want a relationship with God. They are in the faith because they want to know Him, and they want to please Him exclusively. And everything that comes, whether he, whether they get blessed in their ways that they like, or they aren't blessed in the ways that they like, this is not their rock. My relationship to God is my rock. Christianity is supposed to be a supernatural side of the soul, redeemed soul that is going to receive and know Him 
all the time. You get to know his heart. He's going to share some of his burdens with you. And now you're going to start to understand his vision for your life so you can purposely, personally walk in his will. Now, another one that you remember, King Uzziah. The Bible says that King Uzziah did, was raised up by God. But later on, he started to, he started to lose his, um, his relationship to God and make it about something else. And he started to become prideful about what God did to him. Just like God's people to Israel. God raised them up from nothing and made them special. And they used their specialness to prostitute themselves to other nations. What the text actually says. And so if we are going to watch people try to start real and then to turn false and go back, you know, to start in Samuel's type of way or start in Elijah, Elisha anointing and then to turn it into a Gehazi or turn it into the false prophets that are destitute of the truth or turn it into Isaiah when, he, when his heart is lifted up in pride, not, not, his, not his convictions lifted up by God and his deep reverence for God, but to be lifted up in pride where he's drifting away from God. And trying to continue the work that God begun in his own flesh. This is pride and this must die. And when he died, then Isaiah saw him on the throne, high and lifted up. The Lord got to behold the mighty one on his throne. And I tell you the same thing. When we are going to say, okay, we're getting too Gehazi in this house. We're starting to let that kind of a spirit in this house. This must die. This must be crucified and nailed to the cross. So we can behold him on his throne again. Lord, I want to know you because I want to know you. I don't want my faith to be about what you can do for me. I want it to be about what can I, how can we just know each other. You love me. I love you. I don't want you to change, Lord. I'm not going to try to write a new gospel for you to become something in my mind that I, that's going to benefit me. No, God, just let me receive you as you are. Let me, let me receive the reproach and gladly bear the reproach of the cross. If there's something good, let me have that. If it's bad, let me have that too. This gospel, Timothy says, Paul to Timothy, this gospel by the power of God is not of word, it's by the power of God. Over and over you'll see it all the time. God is always making a division in many different ways about the spiritual power and the, and the, and the power of the flesh. The knowledge of the spirit and the knowledge of the flesh. The law of the na of spiritual law and the natural law. There's many different ways. Even Christ in Romans chapter one says he was born of the flesh, he was uh, of the seed of the flesh, and then also of the spirit of holiness because he was overshadowed. Uh, Mary was overshadowed by the spirit of God, overshadowed, and and then she he was born of the flesh and of the spirit of holiness. He was both. He was he was the God man. So over and over throughout the Word of God, you'll always see that there's a differential between the spiritual reality and the natural reality. Okay, man that lives in the natural only and they don't truly really want to obey God, this is enmity with God. The Bible says that carnal, to be carnal, carnally minded is to be enemies with God. That's also scripturally several times as well. To make yourself a person who just wants to live in the carnal nature, what is good for me and not what's good for him first, this is carnally minded. And it's to make yourself, it's, this, is, this is the mindset that is in enmity with God. You can be in the church and be an enemy of God. You can be out of the church and be an enemy of God. All the, you, the only thing that's going to make you right with God is a heart that says, Lord, I just want to know you. All I want to do is live to please you and glorify you because I recognize who you are. And the more I recognize you, the deeper the reverence I come before your mighty throne. Lord, I know who you are. And the only thing I can do is to fall flat on my face and say, what wilt thou have me to do? You are the potter. I am the clay. You mold me and make me. If this is going to make me look bad in the eyes of the world, then so be it. Because that is not my everything. You are. The deeper our knowledge, our sight of our soul knowledge, knowledge of the holy, is where we're going to recognize to whom we praise and to give honor. Amen. And this is where we're going to come with utter reverence before him. People who don't show utter reverence are showing a carnal mind. They're showing a lack of the fear of God in their life. People who live for the things of the world. The Bible says, let your conversation be that of Christ. So when you go to the house of God, what is on people's mind? I know there's a time to change channels to welcome people and see how you're doing and to try to connect with people who might be less strong in the faith or they're just new and you want to be kind to them. Praise the Lord for that kindness. That is wisdom. The Bible says that he that winneth souls is wise. So there is a time to talk about trees and salamanders and tadpoles and how did you... How long have you lived here? Where do you work? How long have this? And where did you get those shoes? Or I sure do like those glasses. Or something like this to kind of carry on the conversation because you know that's where the Lord is leading the moment. And he that winneth souls is wise. 
he that sits there and annihilates them with all kinds of theological knowledge before the person can even take it in is is utterly ridiculous. You know, I've I've seen extremely young people before, and I was imagining, you know what? I don't see them eating steak. I don't see them putting on their own clothes. I don't see them using the restroom the same. They're not the same. They're they're younger. And when you're born again, is the same way. You really just don't know. But as you grow, and then a real Christian, they are, they're going to have a desire to grow. They're going to desire the sincere milk of the word. And as they start to develop this thing, and the things start to make more sense, they're getting through that rhythm with the Lord. Oh, Lord, I know how to trust in you. I remember this. Oh, I remember I messed up there before. But I'm starting to develop a rhythm with, my, with the Holy Spirit. I know how to listen. Oh, I remember this trick before. I'm not going to miss it this time. And he's going to rain upon your life. And like, let it bloom. Amen. He's going to let the thing bloom. And that's one of the things that was going on this week. Besides the two thoughts for today, which is about to, to uh, your, is your praying to God, is your faith about knowing Him, which it should be, or is it about what can I get out of it? And the deeper we start to really know Him, the more reverent we come before Him. If, if, our, if our walk with God is not coming into more utter, utter fear of the Lord and more utter reverence, then something's wrong. We are becoming careless. We're becoming like this one, um, King Uzziah, or even Balaam, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. He was a true prophet, but he was needing to be corrected. There's several times in the Bible where you'll see people off track from the beginning, or true, and then getting off track. There's just different places where they start to turn into carelessness. So our faith is, according to Scripture, it should be gaining strength, like, like Daniel. He had much prayer time. Do you think he ever had challenges where he felt like he didn't need to do it? Of course he did, but he did it anyway, amen, because he was going to be true to his Lord, amen. But um, a couple of the thoughts that was happening this week that I thought was so profound. Um, anybody remember the movie Star Wars? The movie Star Wars is, uh, came out back in 77 when I was really, really small. And during the desert scenes in there, that actually is one of the places that they did some of their filming on the location. They did some of the Redwoods and one of the movies and they did some out in California, different places in California because that's where, that's probably where a lot of the headquarters was, but there was one main place when they started to film the desert scenes, a lot of those shots were filmed in California, this extremely humongous desert, it's very, very popular desert, a lot of people know about it, it's called Death Valley, Death Valley um, Desert. Well, my boss said he was there, he said he's, he's been through there, he said it felt like death, he said I thought I was going to die because it's just never-ending roads through miles and miles and miles of riding. He's just riding, just like, man, am I ever going to make it out of here alive? It's just so long. And everybody who says about it, they all say that's just miles and miles and miles of stuff. And if you go there, it looks like death because there's just no sense of life. It's just all rock and dirt. But what happens is really, really interesting. This is such a praiseworthy thing to see how things really start to line up and, boy, something really changes. It goes literally from desert to bloom. There's all there's yellow flowers that are so yellow and sun that are so blue and black and just the most vivid colors that you can even imagine. It happens maybe once a year when there's a massive storm, a lot of moisture, the moisture's just right, everything's set just right, temperature's just right, and then whoosh, bloom. Flowers everywhere. But one there once in a while, which probably almost everybody on the planet will never see, is called a super bloom where it happens even more profound, where there's just flowers almost over every mountain for miles and miles. So it goes from the epitome of desert to the epitome of an oasis of flowers of every color. And I'm telling you, it will knock your socks off at the infinite miles and miles of beauty of just terrain. of just It's like a fantasy film, and it only lasts for like a day or two days. Every decade. Maybe. It's so rare. Super bloom. And I'm telling you, that's the same with anything. Anything you really get into the rhythm with, you'll find it once in a while. Whew, super bloom. Hit that X factor. Bam, you hit that thing. Now that's the note that I was hitting. That's the real ring when you hit that sweet spot of reality of, wow, that's it. That's the thing that really makes it really wake up and be it all it can be. And that's my idea of like the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you really come into that extreme rhythm of the Holy Spirit where you're like, whoa, I'm seeing you on a much different level. Like I was talking about the other day when I was on the mountain last week and I was just like, oh my, my, I'm seeing something that I don't usually see. And it caused my faith to, to stand in such a way that I felt like I could take down giants. It was like, Lord, I'm seeing you. Under, I'm receiving of you now, Lord. Something that's going to start to slay some dragons that used to 
intimidate me. You know, when Jezebel's scaring Elijah at one point, but another point he's like, I can talk right now and I can bring fire down from heaven and everybody better be scared because I'm in a sweet rhythm with the Holy Spirit. You better be scared, okay? You must not know how to come before him in deep reverence. You must have forgotten who he is and started worshiping Baal because of what he could do for you. Don't come to God as though he's going to do something for you and make God Almighty bail in your eyes. That's wickedness, okay? That's still carnal mindedness, okay? So when I'm telling you that this thing can happen, there's there's a supernatural bloom that is that we were made for. People who have been born from above, they've had an initial bloom. They say, whoa, man, but this feels like a desert for all these other years. That's all right. Just stay on your rhythm with the, the Holy Spirit the best you can. What he's speaking to you. Come with deep reverence before him. Oh, Lord, don't ever be afraid to be emotional before your Lord. Emotions is not everything, just like the law is not everything. There, no, but no flesh shall be justified by the law, and no flesh shall be justified by emotions. It's in his voice. He says, let there be light here. Let there be light in your spirit. Let you be awakened to the righteousness of God. The Father reveals his Son to you. This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. And you can testify, just like Peter did, this is the Son of God. This is Christ, the Son of the living God. And you, this is not something the flesh gave me. The Father revealed that this is definitely the right one. This is Christ that, that, the, that the apostles were preaching. They, they knew experientially. This is the initial bloom. Now what do we do? Continue to release yourself to find out supernaturally there. If you walk by the flesh, you don't care what's going on in your spirit. Because you found other ways of keeping yourself afloat. And you get so full of the world. You get so full of flesh and all the pleasures of this world. Someone brings the gospel and you realize this is conflicting here. You want me to live here and I'm living, I'm living here and here, here. I'm living in the body and the soul. False prophets will bring the spiritual conviction of the Holy Spirit. And they'll put the Christian gospel in the soul. That's, how, that's, that's the difference between a true prophet and a false prophet. A true prophet will make your spirit bloom. And cause you to want to bring utter reverence to God and follow Him all the days of your life. Not for what you're going to get, but because of who He is. How do you know who He is? Because the Father revealed Him to you. That's the beginning of true salvation. And it must continue as that as you seek the new bloom. And if, praise the Lord, it's going to happen after a decade. I don't care how long it happens. But praise the Lord when He brings that super bloom to your spirit. And let, the, let your heart just flow over for you. Even if it's only a couple days. Who cares? But those times of refreshing will come. And those tighter times of utter reverence before his throne, they ought to come too in our life. Amen. That's who we are supposed to be. We were made for the bloom. We were made to have a seed germinate. We didn't even realize how many seeds were in the desert. But when the right storm comes, all of a sudden we're like, okay, okay, let's, let's refresh this thing. Let's hit the restart button. Let's hit the factory reset and start all over. Whew. Wow, all the colors of the Spirit again. <laughs> As weird as that might sound, but there is something very colorful about it. The Bible says that the trees clap their hands. It says the mountains break forth with singing. Uh, one brother who got saved, he was a really wealthy man, actually in Oregon, not that far away, but over in Westland, I think it was. When he got genuinely born again, the pastor didn't say, hey, just join the church and whatever. He says, no, read the book of John with your wife and, and you come back to the church when this Thing when the bloom actually happens to you. If you can come back and testify of the regeneration of the Father revealing the Son and washing your sins away, come back and be a member of the church. And he comes back to the church and says, I can testify that I am new in Jesus. I know the newness of God and it is real to me. His grace has been made real to me. His unfailing love has been shed abroad across my heart and I am radically transformed and boy am I excited to go to church. Comes to the church and hears the word of God and thought it was a fantastic message. Tells the pastor, you said everything right except for you missed one thing. You forgot to tell people, not only does God give you a new heart, but he also gives you new eyes. Everything in my backyard looks so beautiful now. The colors are vivid and clear. I've never seen them under that light. And boy, is God's creation glorious. Amen. God is good. God has a bloom for everybody. It's only a matter of, is it the right temperature? Is our heart the right temperature before Him? Or are we full of the cares of this life? Are we full of the ways of Gehazi? Trying to make the fellowship with the Father turn into, how can He bless me? How is this going to be a selfish gain? He said, no, 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 no. You know, we, don't, we can be overly humble in such a dramatic way that it would make God sick because it's really not according to His voice. I've seen people do that too. They said, oh, I've given away everything. I gave all this stuff away, blah, blah, blah. And it didn't do anything for me at all. And I was like, that's because you did it outside of faith. The Bible says everything outside of faith is sin. If you're over there doing that, why did you do that? Did God tell you to do that? 
or is that your own way of trying to find God when you knew God was telling you something totally different? It's easy, precious hearts, to give up everything you want to except for the thing that God wants you to. But that's where the bloom is. The bloom is in the rhema. It was always in the rhema. And it's always going to be in the rhema. Is it in the Word of God, the written Word of God? This can help you learn the ways of God to see how He works. How does that storm happen? How does all the seeds that are already here, how do they come alive? How does all I've been made for by God to be made alive by God anew? How do you know? You get to watch Him work here. You get to listen to how the great saints of the ages did after the Word of God has been written get to hear about the great testimonies of God. So people like to fight me, they like to challenge me. I always do bring them back to one thing. You just show me the power of God. Because if you don't show me the power of God, you're showing me a false gospel. Shout the glories of God. Show me how the glory of God radically transformed your life from loving the ways of Gehazi to loving the ways of Elijah. And knowing God for the right reasons and not the way of falseness and twisting it the way you see things. People love twisted things because they become disobedient to the Holy Spirit. They become attracted to apostasy because that's who they are. If you're attracted to the true doctrines of God's glory because you are doing the will of your Father and you're setting yourself up for a bloom that you're never going to forget and that bloom is going to testify of the glories of God. Bloom doesn't come without a storm of attesting of faith. A place where you can say, I don't want to be, I don't want to declare His glory right now because I don't want anybody to see me. He's like, good, no bloom. Just stay in the desert if you want to. Let the desert continue. It could be another decade. But for people who are going to say, you know what, whatever it is that you're saying, I will walk in your thus saith the Lord. I will live in the thus saith the Lord. If you said, let there be light before, and you're going to say it again, and this is what I have to do to prove my faithfulness to you, I will go there, and it will rain. The Lord reigns upon those. He reigns in a way that is so personal and causes you to be so confident and so vivid and clear before all men. Don't ever challenge me, precious people online. Don't ever challenge me unless you can show me the rain. If you can't show me the power of God in your life and how it's changed your life, how God showed you a different way than you wanted to walk, like he did for Peter. He says, one day you walked your way, but now you're going to walk your, your other way. The cup that I drank, you're going to drink the same cup of martyrdom. You're going to have to face the same things that this world wants to offer you because they don't want to live by my Holy Spirit. They don't want to honor God. They don't want to deeply reverence me before my throne. They want to walk in their way whether they talk about me or not. They're still walking their own way and they don't want to listen, but I'm going to lead you a different way. Precious people, you want to get my attention? Show me the power of God. Anything else won't get your attention. I'll be nice if you're nice, but you won't have my attention, I promise you in advance, unless you're really trying. If you're going to humble yourself and listen, I'll tell everybody plainly. Everyone who listens to the doctrines taught here gets a real encounter with God. They will get a literal Shekinah bloom. It will happen for them. It will happen for them. Listen to the true doctrines. Just go through John Wesley's material for about an hour and then pop on some modern stuff today. If you can't see a difference, my friend, you got nothing over here. They are looking at the exact same Bible under a radically different light. Elijah light or Gehazi? Elijah, whatever you say, God, I will be tested here. Elijah goes over to this woman. She's a, a widow, and she has a son in the middle of nowhere, and she's about ready to die. The prophet goes to the house and brings the word of the Lord and says, if you are willing to, to make this thing, if you feed me first, I promise you, the blessing of God will come, your wheat will never fail, and, and the oil will pour forth, and it will fail not. That was the word of the Lord for her. What if she said, well, I'm just going to build an ark like Noah did? God said it before. Why can't I build an ark? That wasn't the word of the Lord for her. He didn't say to pray in front of the leaders here, I'm going to go to a den of lions or the, to the, the fiery furnace. It had nothing to do with that. The word of the Lord is now. The word of the Lord is a now word. It's a personal word to check and see, is your faith Elijah or is it Gehazi? Do you want the desert and call it whatever you want? Or do you want the bloom that came from on high? The costly bloom for relationship as opposed to talking about a God that you have drifted far from. Have your, has your heart come up into pride? 
like Uzziah. Does that thing have to die before you can behold him high and lifted up and see these seraphim screaming holy and seeing worship happen like we've seen in the Philadelphia church to come back to what it was all about in the beginning? And Andre Crouch knew it. Take me back to the day I first believed when the balloon was so crystal clear and I knew experientially what it was all about. When the foundation was so firm and the revelation from the Father of the Son to my heart was so vividly clear. Take me back to when it all began. Take me back to a testimony that declares the power of God and not for Gehazi's ways, not for prideful ways, but for the glory of God all the way. Don't let anybody get it a hold of your attention by showing you things in the Word of God. If they don't have a beginning in God, they don't have a beginning in your ear. Tune them out. Say, I heard you where you're going. Stop right there. Tell me your testimony and how are you living right now? Are you coming into deeper fellowship with God? Or are you just coming into deeper ignoring of the rhema and focusing only on the Logos. That's a warning. That's a red flag. I, I believe that the potential of having the same trap that Isaiah came into is why the scripture says not to raise a novice. Because it's such an easy trap to fall into to think that it's always going to be this easy. A real prophet knows it's not that easy. And they know the true cost of what it takes to keep the relationship real as opposed to keeping the religion real. They never want to slip into that and make it something that it's not and bring a sight from the old Wesley days, John Wesley and the Wesley brothers, Charles Wesley, and having it turn into something very shallow. They never wanted it to be that way. But that's why you don't raise a novice because the chances of them understanding for real is not going to be likely. They're not, going to see, they're not going to see the same things as people who had to pay the honest price to stay in the faith of, with God. That's why novice is not to be lifted up quickly, because they will fall into the condemnation of the devil, just like King Uzziah happened to him as well. When the Lord becomes our life, when the Lord truly becomes our oxygen and tank, He becomes our new life, after we behold Him for who He really is, what happens is, no other life I know. There is no other life I know. And this becomes our, a, new, a brand new anchor for our soul, is knowing Him. And knowing that He's worthy to be honored and pleased and obeyed, whether we feel like we're receiving anything or not, whether He's giving us what we want or not, is not really the issue. And it's never supposed to turn into that, that issue as, either. Amen. So this is this is pretty much the whole word for tonight. There was a few other things I was going to say in the beginning, but I just kept going into the word, so I'm going to go ahead and, and leave it there. But we'll we'll get into a couple other things during the discussion. But uh, I believe the word was I believe the word was spoken tonight. I believe the word was received um, by all those that are going to hear for the, from the years to come. Because this is a it's an ongoing war, church. It's an ongoing war. And the war is simply this. Um, it doesn't matter if you stay in the church. It's good to stay in the church because you're trying to still hold on. But it, it, it doesn't matter if we stay in the church if we're turning into Gehazi or a slipping off the page like a lot of the kings did. God has a way of doing things on this earth and releasing his word to this earth. And it was through the prophets who lived a very different life. It wasn't through the kings who lived a normal life and people wanted to follow that path. His people said, no, we want a king. And, and, and you see, most of the kings didn't do well. Out of all the kings that, that had begun, most of them didn't do well. Most of them were totally wicked. And some of them were up and down because that wasn't how God meant it to be. God has a way of doing it so the bloom will be real and sh unshakable. God wants to continue to prove himself to those that want to continue to allow him to bring the right temperature and the right storm and the right moisture for our hearts to know, once again, the beginning place in our faith, substantial and evidential and glorious, miraculous, royal faith that we know came 
from the very, very serious throne of the Almighty God. As He reigns upon our hearts, as He reigns in glory and we receive of Him just who He is. Just who He is is enough to make us say Amen. Just who He is is so worthy to know that how can we ever even know who He is? There's, never a, there's no way you could ever know all this stuff. All the, all the splendors of His majesty. And then to turn that into somehow we can figure out this thing for our own gain, that is of the devil. We don't ever want our hearts to turn from that. The devil is always going to war try to push us back to Gehazi and back to Uzziah slipping off into pride. And God is always going to say, Haven't you learned yet? Haven't you learned yet that I am your exceeding and great reward? I am your all and all. I am. The hardest thing for our flesh in this world where eyes are looking at us and we concern ourselves with church eyes and worldly eyes and our job eyes and our family people's eyes and trying to worry what they consider and what they care about instead of what we know is going to keep the bloom happening on a fairly regular schedule. Like Old Faithful, every hour. I think it's cool when people start to know they have a rhythm with God. I know God's going to show up in just a matter of an hour or two. I know my prayer time with Him. I know how this is going. And I, I know this place in Him. Smith Wigglesworth said it like this. He says, if you go to bow in prayer and the heavens don't open up, if the Lord does not move right away, something's wrong. Something's wrong. He knew the Lord on such a, a, an incredible level that He could talk like that. How many preachers today can say that? When I go to bow my head, the heavens open. A miraculous thing that starts to happen. And because we don't talk like that, it's because we don't know that kind of experience. We don't, most people, they don't, they don't preach in a way that they don't live. So people who live for the world, they have worldly preaching. It's, they're being honest about what they see. But they're honestly wrong, because they don't see. And they don't come before Him with a great reverence. So, because that's true, having a hard time explaining on that one just now, so I'm going to leave that alone for now, but I'll, we'll get back to it if it starts to come alive again. But, uh, we don't want our, our hearts to ever lose sight of, our, of the wonder of God. We don't ever want it to lose that. I believe that what, what it was in the beginning ought to be a huge focus of us to make sure we don't lose sight of what it really means to be. There's many different ways of continuing on in our version of the faith while the voice of the Holy Spirit is being ignored. And that is a really easy trap to fall into because so many build gigantic circles around it and they do work. But the bloom is not what it was in the beginning. And the bloom is not the same as what we see in Acts chapter 2. And if, if, if the standard is so high, like Smith Wigglesworth shows, if he can show us something that we are not experiencing, all it means is that we have every reason to come deeper before him, not to just be bowing down like a blade of grass, Isaiah 58, but to actually do what he wants. God wants us to take good care of each other. He wants us to be kind and understanding to one another. He wants us to be helpful to one another. So much is already set in stone for God to say, now I have a lot of, <clears throat> I've got a lot of room to work here because there's not a lot of problems here. A lot of the love is established and it's very easy for God to do a lot because this is a wonderful foundation. And the church and the families in the, in the church are all founded in love. Boy, God has a lot of room to move. There's a lot of advancing that can happen at that point. And God will continue to bless us and He'll keep the bloom real. God will keep the, the vision real. He'll keep us coming back to the original vision but bringing us more authentic, authentic and more. So when we go to pray after 10 years of serving the Lord, it is, it is more vivid. It is a bigger bloom. It is more real. He can, I can trust you with more and more and more. How does God trust us with more? The more we obey His rhema word. The more we obey what he is telling us personally. Anybody who tries to avoid the rhema, it's not hard to tell. Because they'll, they'll, be like a, they'll be a broken record for the rest of their ministry. Saying the same thing over and over. 
and no fresh new revelations of God. Not a, no, nothing new to share, no fresh things from God. But for those that will really wait upon the Lord, they will really hear, hear God's direction. Challenges that they don't want to face. This is how we gladly bear the reproach of the cross. All it meant was Christ was willing to do what he didn't want to do. And if we're going to follow Christ, we're going to follow his example of how he obeyed the Holy Spirit and God the Father. I only do what my Father's doing, whether it's miracles or it's sending me to the cross. And people don't want to follow Christ that way. They don't want to follow God's lead that way. They only want to follow him for the things that make them look good in the eyes of the world. And not to the place where they have to surrender their will to do what God is leading them personally for and through. The test of faith that God leads us into are not always pleasurable. Oftentimes they're not. Because that's where the faith is being tested. To find out, do we love Him more? Amen. Do we love Him more? Are we obeying the commandments because we want to look good and religious in the eyes of the world? Or are we doing it because we know this is where He is? Are we doing it because we know we're going to get something from someone else or from Him? Or are we doing it because we love Him and we just want to do what He wants to do because that's just who I am now? Those that are born again of the Spirit, that is faith. With that kind of a faith, we will overcome the world. The temptations will come, but that's not your rock and you'll overcome it. A new temptation will come, and I'm already overcoming it because that's not who I am. I am new. Once in a while, I'll look at the waves and, oh, and sink. But because I'm new, help me quickly, take me up. Put me back up again. Let me walk according to your word. You said to come, I'm here. Let me stand on the water again. Let me live in the impossible. Let me live in the bloom. Let me live in the super bloom. Let your power be evident in my life on a regular cycle. So everyone will know this person has a prayer life that shakes the heavens and scares hell. We have every right to go deeper and to hear him and obey him on a more critical level. It's going to cause a lot of problems, but I'm telling you, that's where the power's at. Problems on this earth is worth it if that's what he's calling us into in order to be real with the rhema. Anybody who wants to avoid trouble and assume the rhema is not real when it's calling us to, to be humble and to, to deal with problems we don't want to deal with? It's not true. Our strength comes when we go with his leading. And if someone else kind of comes alongside of you and tries to make it something else, let him know. Don't turn into Gehazi, my friend. You better be very careful. A lot of people have come through my circles and they didn't listen. And they have faced very, very hard hardships because they wouldn't listen to the word of the Lord. They're trying to, they're trying to take on an anointing that they don't know. Their ego knows it, but their obedience doesn't. And that is a very risky thing. You saw that talent, that, that he was being kind of knocked down a little bit like Samson was. More and more and more and more and more. And then finally he gives up and collapses. And Gehazi was weak there too. And Satan continues to bring him in there. You can get something from that. Shouldn't you get more from all this work you're doing? Until he finally collapses and does something ridiculous and actually goes out of his way to do the unthinkable against the word of the Lord. It wasn't good for him. It wasn't good for Ananias and Sapphira. It wasn't good for the prophet talking to the other prophet, having bread and water with him. It wasn't good for anybody. There were so many instances in the Bible where we see the, the severity and the criticalness of, of how much important it is to stay in the river of the Rhema Word of God. Rhema is relationship. And the bloom is real. Letters is religion. Letters is logos. Logos is for the Rhema to be real. Amen. Well, we'll talk about some more things in the, in the discussion time. But this word was heard today, and that's all that matters. That we want relationship over religion any day of the week. And no matter what it costs, no matter what the consequences will be, no matter the misunderstandings that will happen, is irrelevant. Because He is the one we're going to live to please. Amen. <laughs>
Father, we praise you today and thank you for the word. Thank you for stirring our hearts and helping us see eternal reality. Help us to see, help us, thank you for helping us see your word in a light that actually, that is going to glorify your name, Lord God. Keep our sight really clear in this house, radically clear. Keep heaven's word here. Help us to obey you further and further in places that you're, you're knocking on our door about. So we can be waiting upon you knowing that the rain will come. And the super bloom will come. And our hearts will rejoice in a way that couldn't happen without the victory we found in you. God, I pray that your people will hear you organically and obey you organically and experience an organic re revelation of your Son over and over again, God. I pray that the heavens be opened up in our prayer closets, and if they aren't, I pray that we pay the price to live that way. All of us included, God. So easy to be, say and so not easy to do, God. Give us the courage to get radical in, in sight of the soul, beholding your Son for who he is, the conqueror of death and hell and resurrection and the life. Give victory to all those that are seeking your face. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. showed you guys these but I'm going to show them to everyone this is the one I've had before this is 1966 Jack Chick track the Beast it's a very good track and really well put together and then here's another one that I remembered from out in Crawfordville they actually had this one from 1981 and it's quite a bit different you can see the difference in color one's darker than the other one this is the old one it's kind of wore out and then the newer one newer it's actually newer and actually newer looking but it's quite different. I wanted it for a long time and I got it for a lot less than I was hoping to pay for. And also, wham, one of the first tracks that the Brother Jack Chicks ever made. And I finally got it and I paid a lot less than I've seen this thing go for. I've seen this thing go for like $500 before. I got it for less than half of that. This is a very, very important track. It's really good. For those who are very serious collectors, which I am, I was very happy to see it. And I literally can't believe I got it for the price I got it for. Here's a new one he got called Gold Fever. I yeah, forgot. I got that in the mail. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. I got this. I read it online, but I forgot what it was about. So, But that one's new. And then this is something that's going on right now. This is really scary. I'm not sure if this is the same thing, but Battle Cry is always talking about Rome and stuff like this. Oh, cool. He's got this old track on here. Operation Somebody Cares. I wish that he'd make this track again. But he's trying to redo this thing. He's trying to get another thing where people are really going to press through with evangelism. That's really cool. That, that track right there, I tried to bid on it for $960, and I lost. Someone outbid me. It, it, it went for $970. That's amazing. It's a communist track, and it's, it's one of the rarest ones I've ever heard of, and it's actually just there. But anyways, this is one here. It's um, uh, the Pope. He had a video <coughs> online about uh, gathering together. It has a, a, an Islam guy saying, I want to worship Allah. Another one says, he's a Catholic, and I just want to worship Christ. And I had a Jewish man saying, I just want to worship God. And then I had another one, I think it was a Buddhist or a Hindu, I just want to worship Buddha. I think it was Buddha. So those four things that are all not Christian, maybe they, maybe they have some type of relationships in some places, but those who have known of God, they're, they're going to know that these are false. So... Um, trying to bind them together, and by the time the end of the video is going, they said, I just want love. I just want love. I just want love. I just want love. They are all willing to deny Allah. They're willing to deny Christ. Well, they're false Christ, of course, because otherwise they wouldn't do it. Or if the false God. And Judaism's God, though it begun true, it's become radically apostate. So even though they're saying God, 
because they're seeing it in a wrong light. They're willing to cash, cash in their apostate version of God and reunite with Buddha. God, who it's not true anymore. They're, they're, out, they're outside of his covenant, like you see in Romans 11, Zechariah 11 as well, and Allah and whatever. So they're, they're, that's what the Pope is doing right now. He just made a new video talking about that, and Jack Jick was mentioning it in his, in his um, online deal, his email, letting us know what's going on. And I, I just said, look, this is, this is what the Bible is all about. This is how we know he's false. If, 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 you don't, if you have discernment enough, you should have known from the beginning that the popes are not true. Okay, that should be a really, really no-brainer for Christians, okay? I'm not making fun of Catholics. If you're a Catholic and you really want to serve the Lord, you got a childlike heart, God will lead you. But come where He tells you to go. And I don't understand how anybody could stay in the Catholic Church and stay right with God. I don't know. That's not between me and you. I mean, that's between you and the Lord and me and the Lord. You could be a Catholic or a Pentecostal or a Baptist or whatever and not be um, and not being seeking God. You could start to turn into something else, which is not supposed to be. But here's the letter that he sent. I'm going to read it, actually. It's really neat. I read part of it already. Jack Chick writing something I never knew this before. This is actually kind of personal on his part. It says, As I was leaving to go home from work one night, I was given a book from Canada, a testimony written by a former biker. According to his story, one day while he was stoned on drugs, he spotted our track, bewitched, lying on the grass. He read it and was shaken. The story made a real impact on him, and God used it to, to help change his life. I was overjoyed for that man, but then I, w then I was overwhelmed, and I broke into tears when I remembered how my daughter, Carol, posed for me to draw the girl in Bewitched. Jesus said, I came not to send peace, but a sword, Matthew 10, 34. For a long time, Carol, his daughter, Jack Jake's daughter, was my enemy. In her teens, it was rebellion from church to drugs. A neighbor boy who was filled with hate made my life a torment for my daughter. He got her unsaved friends to make jokes and ridicule my tracks. Ultimately, the pressure was too much. She turned against my wife and me. I didn't know how to reach her. Just a few years before her death, I told her, Carol, because you don't respect your mother and I, God will take you home. I, you, will have, you will not have a long life. My daughter knew all my buttons and she pushed them. She went her own way, even when she finally came home too sick to care for herself. She no longer called me dad, but Jack. I felt like a failure as a father. That was hard. But, I, but I'd still pray with her. I remembered how she had read my tracks as a child, even memorizing my first one. Which that might have been it, I think. I'm not sure if it was Why Not Revival or this one. But um, this was a huge beginning for him and Holy Joe as well. Amen. She, she knew the gospel, and when her life was falling apart, she knew where to turn. Just about a week before she died, she started calling me daddy. We talked about God a lot, and she let me pray for her. That meant so much to me, but her life's choices had taken their toll. Carol died at just 49. I believe my daughter was saved, and I believe Carol will be in heaven when I go home. No matter what you're going through with your family, don't stop praying for your kids. No matter what, you can be the person to make that difference, just like the grandmother in Bewitched. And don't fail to give tracts to young people's parents. Tell me that this stuff just soaks into them and shapes their lives. The truth makes a difference. Your brother in Christ, Jack. That's pretty powerful. I like that yeah. story. Yeah. Amen. That's so, amazing. some of the things that's going on. The other one I didn't tell you guys about, I'm going to give you the short version of it right now, and it's that... Um, there was a gentleman using this scripture in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, which we've been talking about a lot about spiritual warfare, and that's what I really see it as, and it is. And what this gentleman was using it for was actually false. And so I, uh, I made a video about it. I made an hour-long video dealing with a couple different problems, which is that annihilation doctrine, which is false. Everybody knows that when you go to heaven, you don't just burn up and that's it. You know, that's a false doctrine. It's not scriptural. The Bible says that their smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever. Okay, that's just one. And I showed him more, gave him the long version of that answer, and I was trying to be nice. I, I, I was being nice, but then I, I was being clear, too. It's was like, look, tell me your testimony, or please know that this is not the way we roll, okay? Husbands, love your wives. Okay, 525. Here's one verse. I'll just read it to you again. This is something we've been going over and gearing it towards spiritual warfare, which it's about. 
Husbands, love your wives, even as, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Okay? Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So we know that Christ did die for his church. Sure. But it doesn't mean it was only certain ones. You know, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And he's saying that the all, the world, is only all the world of those that are his called people. He says that this scripture would be calling, um, he didn't say love every woman. You know, he, he, the scripture says, husbands, love your wives and other women too, even as Christ loved everybody. I mean, and, and gave himself for it. Now he gave himself for his church, and his church is whosoever will, their own will, surrender to God's will. And his current covenant, which is the cross of Calvary, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, come to it for real, and the Father will genuinely born again you and reveal his Son to you. He will manifest himself to those that will really receive him as he is. That's the truth. But this is not teaching that Christ only died for a certain people. I mean, yeah, ultimately he did, because he foreknows. He said, I foreknew you. I foreknew who was going to pick me. But you did have to pick him. And you did have to repent, and you did have to obey Him, and you did have to continue on with Him, and you did have to endure till the end. And so when people try to make their version of Christianity, I'm secure in Jesus because I'm part of His family, and there's nothing going to change that. Okay, limited atonement is a doctrine that is not true. It's limited to those that will repent and be saved and stay on track. That's what, it's really, that's what the Bible actually says. And it's in the full counsel of God, you take it any other way than that, I believe you're in serious error. And I don't believe people ought to consider themselves right with God, no matter what, because I'm just born. I was, I was called from the foundations of the earth, and that's just the way it is. Okay, that's not regeneration. Okay, I don't see how anybody could possibly be regenerated by the Holy Spirit and come up with this kind of an idea, and and preach indicate with an indication that some of you can't be saved because God didn't call you from the foundations of the earth. I believe limited atonement is a very, very serious error. Um, if you cannot take both sides of that coin, I believe you're in error. Okay, Totally Calvinist and totally Arminian, I believe that they're both you, both, you see both sides in Scripture, so you need to take both and realize that this is a supernatural reality that we don't have any business making a fuss about. Not that we don't need to take the Word of God seriously, but just to say this is an ongoing battle that will never end, and it's not going to do any good for anybody. Okay? It's not the right kind of security that we have in God. We have security in God because of His promises. Yes, we have promises in His Word, and we have promises because we know Him. Okay, We need to have a revelation of God. That's also in the Scripture. You'll never, I mean, not never, but oftentimes you'll find the Bible talking about the Gospel as the power of God, the Father revealing His Son, and that's where we got to leave it. That's what the Scripture actually teaches about our Gospel. Not of Word, but of power. Over and over and over you'll see it. That was First Thessalonians Chapter 1, uh, we already said 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the light of the glorious gospel, the image of God. Didn't just say believe, it said the image of God in the face of Jesus Christ, by the glory of God. Timothy was the same thing. Come to the reproach of the cross, or some kind of a thing like this. Um, not just receiving the good, but also receiving um, the gospel, and for what, the, the persecution of the gospel, but by the power of God. You know, over and over, it will always say, I'm, I'm, um, Paul said it like this, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. Every time he builds his church upon the rock, I say it all the time, this is my life's message. And I keep seeing it further and further and further, and I'm seeing the spiritual warfare thing that I'm working on further and further and further as well. These things are all connected. These are the two things that are massively lost from the church's emphasis so accidentally sliding into making the emphasis something else, causing people to be accidental Gehazis. It's not okay. So that's why I'm going to emphasize it. And if, if the church is supposed to be a powerful church by the power of the Holy Spirit, then let's take the Holy Spirit to be our, our God, the one who's going to convict us of our sin. When I go, when He comes, He's going to come to reprove the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. Not just to make your hair stand up, not just to get you through the day, not just to help you do what you want. He's powerful. His program, 
not for yours. He's here to comfort you in His will, not yours. Amen. So don't turn it to something else. He's here to comfort. Oh, he's here to help us. Yes, he, yes, there's time when God will do that. He'll bring mercy when He knows that we can't go further. But at the same time, overall, God is here to help you do His will. Amen. Not yours. Amen. Um, so no, I don't agree with the scripture being a doctrine for that. You, you believe He closed the door and left it at that. It's not true. Husbands, love your wife. We, the context is about family. That's what it was about. So don't try to turn it into something else. And it was getting a lot of attention. And people were actually swallowing it. That's why I'm making this video. So, um, Annihilation, the Pope, bringing people together. All those are the three things that I wanted to challenge this week. I did. Made an hour-long video. And kept on talking. And said things that is just something that we can't forget. Because we go by our own sight when we are not blooming in God over and over. We are drifting from God. So our conclusions in that state of drifting from God is obviously going to be false. But if we go back to the times when there was mighty refreshing, mighty conviction, mighty hum hum humility, mighty repentance, and God was so obviously evident, like in 1970, the Asbury College Revival, you see the emphasis was not in self-improvement, it was not in let's help your emotional problems, it was in confession of sin, sin, sin. When God showed up, that's all he wanted to talk about. So when that's not what's happening, what's going on? Are we adopting another spirit? Are we slipping over to the Pope's ways? That's a very big problem. Don't slip into the Pope's ways. And don't bring religion down to whatever you pick and it's all good. It's all just about love anyway. No, it's not. It's about the glory of the true and living God, period. Amen. It's not about whatever. It's Christ. It's not whatever Christ you want to make it into. Many Christ will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. They're liars. So there's only one Christ who made the fashions of the heaven and the earth. And he bought them with a price of his own blood. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Christ is coming back to judge the world. The quick and the dead. He's coming back to judge in righteousness. On a white horse, King of kings and Lord of lords. Things are getting crazy. Look up, your redemption draweth nigh. But if the Pope sounds good to you, you're in deep trouble, brothers and sisters. If that sounds good to you, motivational speaking sounds good to you, it's careful your heart, my friend. You could be drifting away. The church was never meant to drift away from the miraculous. We were never meant to drift away from the ah, awful power of the Holy Spirit. Awe-filled power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? It's supposed to be powerful. Don't let it come into something else and you're going to lose your reverence for God. That means you don't know who He is anymore. The sight of your soul is drifting to something else. And the Pope is going to snatch you up. You know why He's going to snatch you up? Because you're rebelling against God as He is. Don't let it happen to you. Stay where the true fire is truly burning. Keep the vision high and holy. That's where He's dwelling. And if you want to be with Him high, then come low on this earth and you'll be high with Jesus and seated in high places with God. And authorized by God. Not by a guy with a Bible who thinks he knows everything. I don't care if you've got a degree. Show me the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll call you a false prophet because you are one. Amen. That's why you love the Pope instead of the true God. He's the vicar of Christ in your eyes. He's the vicar of hell in mine. And all those who are washed in blood will call him the same thing. He's not a true prophet. He's the false prophet of the Bible. Man, man, man. 666. Government, religion, and finance. Me, me, me. Not he, he, he. Our religion is God, God, God. Obey, obey, obey. Fear, fear, fear. Tremble, tremble, tremble. And honor, honor, honor. Glory, glory, glory. Praise Him, praise Him, praise Him. And those that worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. And beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits and make sure that it's of God. And examine your heart and make sure you are in the faith. Why I warn everybody? Because the Bible does it all the time. Because it's not, it's easy to slip into the Pope land. It's easy to slip into Uzziah. It's easy to slip into carelessness. And that is not where the King is. He brings the freedom, the Spirit of God brings a freedom. That Christ made free. Amen. The liberty that Christ made free. But it isn't living carelessly. It's not to live carnally minded. Amen. It's to live holy. 
And his holiness only comes from the one who is holy. He's speaking and we're obeying and that's the only holiness there ever was in the history of the whole planet, period. And without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. You'll stand before him and your name won't be in the book and you'll say, I never knew you because I talked and you didn't listen. Oh, I had a Bible, I obeyed you, I read it all the time, I talked about it all over the place. Yeah, and you messed a lot of people up because you weren't obeying me, says the Lord. And now you're in deep, deeper trouble because the false prophets undergo greater condemnation, says the Lord. Amen. Do I get scared talking because I don't want to say something wrong? You better believe I do. I take my job very, I take this position extremely seriously. That's why I do a lot of weeping. Just like all the other boys ahead of me, all the old men behold, ahead of me. Learn how to dial into the Lord. Learn how to bend their knee. Oh, Lord Almighty. And they weren't afraid to groan in the Holy Spirit because they know where their Lord is and nothing else mattered but Him. I don't want to lose touch with my God, they said. I know the beginning. I know the beginning super blue and I'm not going to lose it. Oh, Amen. Amen. Don't you ever try to get me off my track. Say the wrong word. I love you, but I'll give you a warning shot, maybe. <laughs> People want to get... A, I'm not going to give many warning shots on my page anymore. People are going to talk ridiculous. I'm going to lead that led by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to, hopefully, in my will, I'll cl close you off. I know you don't want the Lord. My Bible says, don't cast his glorious pearls of how to get to know God to the swine who don't care. You better care. You don't care. You're crazy. You're not even on the map for the Word of God. God doesn't waste his time with swine, and neither does his people. But if he tells me to give you a warning shot, I'll give you a warning shot. I'll give you kindness. Continue to spit in his face, I'll continue to turn it off. I'll, I'll, if, he's, if he allows me to. Amen. If he allows me to. Amen. 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 I feel fire in this house. I feel fire. Something, uh, something changed this week, man. It really did. I'm excited. I feel like I feel like that old edge with more wisdom and compassion. You know how the Bible says he's gonna what is it called? He's gonna use the pottery where the clay is gonna shape us. Sometimes he cuts things out of us, some of the rough spots, so I can be I can grow and still be and, and learn how to be strong in him but more compassionate so it's more of him and less of me. Amen. 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 I feel like we just had another sermon already. Sorry about that. But anyways, that was the extra well, stuff that I'm going to talk. thinking about the thing you were wrapped around on your head, though. What's that? You, you were thinking about something that stopped, and you said you were going to talk about it when you came. Well, it, it eventually started to come together again anyway, because it was about the heavens opening and when you pray, and if something misses there, so I started to gather it again together. I just didn't indicate that that happened. I, I, I operate on a very, you know, very natural and very hard to remember what I say operation way and it's obvious when the when you can feel the fire turn on in here it just feels good you can feel that grounding of your soul saying mm, I need direct talk I need to know where where it is and where it isn't and it's so good for the soul to know again oh man oh fear not for the Lord I was with you amen fear not for I am with you says the Lord oh come on more than conquerors. Who can be against you if the Lord be with you? And if the Lord is your portion, who can be against you? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 He's a healer. He, the healer's in the house. Amen. You got needs. We got to bring it when the king, when the water of Bethesda is moving. We need a, we have a need and we have needs in here. And we need you more than anything. We want healing, but we need you. If it's okay in our relationship, if the healings can come too, without disrupting our relationship with you, Lord, then bring the healings. Because the healer's in the house. Hallelujah. Oh. Amen. God is too good. You know what? We gotta sing. We gotta sing while we're on fire now. I'm gonna bring the books out.